Good morning and welcome uh, back to the second day of the Global Environmental Justice uh, Conference. Uh, today should be uh, today should be a, a really uh, excellent day to follow what already was uh, uh, I thought a, a, a brilliant first day. So so uh, stay with us all day. It's going to be great. Uh, we're going to begin with uh, uh, looking at a, a slightly different uh, approach. Uh, the title of this uh, uh, segment is Environmental Defenders, the Role of NGOs in Human Rights Conflicts. So we're going to focus on, on uh, the uh, intersection of human rights, defense, environmental uh, justice, uh, and defending uh, the environment. Speaking with us today, first will be Alfred Brunel, uh, who is an internationally recognized environmental rights activist and lawyer from Liberia. He is the Tom and Andy Bernstein Visiting Human Rights Fellow at Yale Law School and has previously served as Associate Re Research Professor and Distinguished Scholar in Residence at Northeastern University School of Law. For more than two decades, Brunel has advocated to protect the environment and human rights in West Africa and to empower Liberians and West Africans victimized by resource exploitation. He co-founded and headed the public interest law, non-governmental environmental rights organization, Green Advocates International, and co-established the Alliance for Rural Democracy. In 2019, Brunel won the prestigious Goldman Environmental Prize for his work protecting tropical rainforests in Liberia and from development by palm oil companies. He will be followed by Justice Antonio Herman Benjamin, Professor Benjamin is a justice at the National High Court of Brazil and has been since 2006. He is a goodwill ambassador for environmental justice organization of the, Amer organization of the Organization of American States, the OSA. He is the chair of the World Commission on Environmental Law, the secretary general of the UN International Advisory Council for the Advancement of Justice, Governance and Law for the Environment, Environmental Sustainability, and the leading founder of the Global Judici Judicial Institute on the Environment. Professor Benjamin teaches comparative environmental law and biodiversity law. And he has published widely on these subjects. Professor Benjamin is co-drafter of a number of Brazilian environmental statutes, including the 2012 Forest Code and the 1998 Crimes Against the Environment Act. They will be followed by two distinguished discussants, Professor Jim Silk, who is the Binger Clinical Professor of Human Rights at Yale Law School, where he teaches the Lowenstein International Human Rights Clinic and co-directs the Shell Center for International Human Rights. He is the director of Yale College's multidisciplinary academic program in human rights studies, which he founded in 2014. In the 2015-16 academic year, Jim established and directed Juncture, Exploring Explorations in Art and Human Rights, a year-long program that included interdisciplinary graduate seminars, visiting speakers, visiting artists, and collaborating with students on uh, creative work. MFA travel fellowships, speakers, and, and symposium are also part of the program. Jim was formerly director of the Robert F. Kennedy Memorial Center for Human Rights in Washington. From 1999 until 2019, he was a founding board member of the Fair Labor Association, which promotes workers' rights globally by monitoring compliance with labor standards in participating company supply chains. Jim received the Yale Law Women's Teaching Award in 2003. He received the M. Shannara Gilbert Human Rights Award from the Society of American Law Teachers in 2019. In 2009, he was the Bram Fisher Visiting Human Rights Scholar at the University of Witwatersrand Law in Johannesburg. After graduating from Yale Law School in 1989, Jim was an attorney in, at a Washington firm. His pro bono work there included representing Virginia death row inmates and appeals. And before law school, he was an editor and policy analyst and senior writer for the U.S. Committee for Refugees. He has a BA in economics from the University of Michigan and an MA in humanities from the University of Chicago. Following him will be Tim Herschel Burns, Tim Herschel Burns is a JD candidate at the Yale Law School. He's a member of the Lowenstein International Human Rights Clinic, a co-chair of the Yale Environmental Law Association, and a board member of the Yale Law School National Security Group. He is also the co-founder of Law Students for Climate Accountability, 
and a lead author of the law firm Climate Change Scorecard. Before law school, he spent two years as a Peace Corps volunteer in Benin. Tim holds a BA in political science from South Rockmore College. So I'd like to bring Alfred to the stage uh, for what promises to be an engaging session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gerard. Good morning. Please permit me to extend my appreciation to the Dean, faculty, and staff of the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Special thanks is to Professor Gerard Torres and Amity Dulido, as well as to Christian for extending me an opportunity to participate in this year Environmental Justice Conference on the team negotiating institutional transformation, international and comparative approaches to justice in environmental protection. It is also a privilege to join Justice Antonio Herman Benjamin, Justice of the National High Court of Brazil, Jean Silk, Benjo Clinical Professor of Human Rights, and my own student, uh, Tim Hershey Bryan, who is actively providing research support to two of my projects one involved in de designing a climate delegation strategy across West Africa, and the second looking at the comparative research on how unsecured land rights is driving migration, both across West Africa through the Sahara and the Mediterranean Sea, and as well as from Central America through the human caravans toward the southern border of the United States. For the next 10 minutes, I have been called upon to undertake a journey to explore environmental defenders, the role of NGOs in human rights and environmental conflicts. The emphasis of mine. That journey compels me to discuss how NGOs function in the contentious arena of human rights and the environment. It says that NGOs are an expression of civil society and play an institutional role in the formal consideration of human rights norms. That because they are outside of the formal structure of politics, they often represent a threat to state hegemony. And in that regard, NGO remains subject to the discipline of state power, even as this challenge is authority. This tension, according to the organizers of this conference, creates a variety of challenges, but also opportunities for concerted action and resistance. I'm therefore inviting you on a fact-finding mission on this journey to investigate how Green Advocates International and NGO based in Liberia that I funded while I was still a law student fit into this arrangement has advanced by the organizers. So as NGOs, normally when you want to address an issue, you try to identify what the problem is. So most of you will bear with me that NGOs are a continuous love-hate relationship. Yes, they exist in the continuous love-hate relationship across the globe with a diverse range of stakeholders. But this is another story for another time. And I want to make sure that I take you back to West Africa so we can focus on the key case studies to establish the basis of the theories advanced by these organizers. So we start in my own country, Liberia. Between 2009 and 2004, the government of Liberia awarded about 75% of its total landmarks to multinational corporations to engage into logging, mining, oil and gas, and agricultural investment across the country. Two of the world's largest oil palm corporations were awarded more than a million acres of forest land. By 2011 and 2012, both those sorts and other machines were clearing and clear cutting the forest and running through the lands of communities like a locust that were destroying their history, their culture, their traditions, and their sacred sites. In an effort to transform this forest land into a wilderness of oil palm plantations, so we found out what the problem was. 
And as NGOs, the next thing you do when you identify the problem, you engage into what we refer to as evidence-based field research. And so we deploy our tools and went to investigate. And through our research, we gather data and proof that the oil palm companies were engaged in the destruction of the community sacred sites, their burial grounds, their crops, their farmland. Our research also show that the swamps and wetlands that were utilized by the indigenous people were all being destroyed by these companies, which were a source for food and protein for the indigenous people. The locals refer to the forests and their creek and streams as their universities, as their supermarkets, and their pharmacies, because these were resources that were very much vital to them. All of these institutions and sources of livelihood and centuries of history, culture, and tradition were under threat, leaving these communities completely vulnerable to either become slave laborers to work on the plantation of these oil palm companies or to be forcefully evicted. In a number of the communities where research show, locals could barely find few wood to cook their own daily meals. Some had to even pay more or travel to urban areas to procure their food. We observed that these companies were not only grabbing the community's customary land, they embarked on a strategic agenda in concert with the government to deliberately undermine the ability and capacity of these communities to sustainably produce their own traditional food. They simultaneously introduced monoculture, which completely obliterated the existing indigenous Chinese system. Our research reveal that more than 75% of the people who live in these areas form part of the agrarian labor workforce, and that most of them were subsistence farmers engaged in resource governance, and that resource governance was a matter of survival, the so-called dry rice and palm oil issue that exists in West Africa. That as a result of the weak governance and inadequate regulation, these companies were displacing communities and degrading the land with subsistence farmers depending on to feed themselves and their family. So what did we do with the research? We mobilize, we build a network, and we build the resistance of these communities. So with the research data, we pursued a bottom up process, designing training manuals, organizing communities, and building the resistance. We also pursue a top-down process, building network, setting up multi-stakeholder initiatives, training, building the institutions and, and others. With that system put into place, the resistance and the network, we then decided that we need to figure out how to provide legal support. So we utilized a series of legal strategies, pursuing domestic litigation, pursuing litigation using regional human rights system, but also utilizing non-judicial grievance mechanism to address the situation that uh, the communities were faced with. With the legal support representing hundreds of defenders across those communities, whose campaign and grievances were being criminalized by the government of Liberia. In addition to utilizing the series of strategic litigation methods against the company and the government of Liberia to address the rights of those communities as an NGO, we we'll also pursue some policy work, legislative work, and institutional reform. So with that data, as we're pursuing the litigation and we're mobilizing the communities, we use a combination of complaint, fear, research, massive media outrage, community mobilization and resistance that forced the government of Liberia and the companies to make policy and institutional changes in their structures and policies. For example, the companies created new departments because of this re of, 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 of our advocacy to engage the local communities and revise the standard operating procedures. They were forced to hire external expertise to provide expert support. In addition to the companies, the government itself was forced to bring about reform. We changed the laws addressing forest rights. We changed the law concerning forest rights. And, uh, and as it is now, for example, the Bureau has one of the most progressive land right legislations across the region. So as we pursued these things and we made progress in one victory, we had to also confront a series of security threats. Of course, this is a situation for NGOs. As I said, we are in a love hate relationship. You advance these reforms. And then as these reforms are being advanced, then you start getting feedback from the government. And so as we made progress in one victory, we also were confronted with a series of security threats. Over a dozen protests 
organized by the communities were being confronted with massive criminalization and security forces who were going in and attacking these communities. They were heavy handed, uh, activists were arrested, they were imprisoned, um, people were accused of being anti-government, um, anti-country, anti-investment, anti-development. Uh, there were a series of stigmatizations uh, that were instigated against defenders and communities. And as an NGO, were caught up in this conundrum, trying to figure out how to provide support to the indigenous communities, but at the same time, trying to find a way to, to resolve those conflicts that were evolving. To distract the conflict and the contentious relationship that existed between us and the government, we also figured out there were a series of opportunities to collaborate to build partnership and to build cooperations. Because NGO are important institutions of learning and mentoring, developing innovative knowledge portals and serving as a platform for emerging young leaders. We have seen and witnessed how contentious flashpoints have opened avenues for collaboration on policy and institutional reform, both at the corporate and government levels, utilizing a tripartite multi-stakeholder initiative consistent of the government, the private sector, and NGOs. For example, the land rights reforms that I talk about were accomplished under the auspices of the Land Rights Steering Committee, which we are part of. The Community Rights Law, which we co-author, was achieved under the umbrella of the Community Forestry Working Group, which was a tripartite system involving the private sector, the government, and NGOs. It was indeed a delicate balance to hold the government and corporations accountable, at the same time identifying a seat at the table to constructively engage. As I have indicated, we NGOs have been frequently asked to play a leading role in researching and drafting of legislation and regulation because of our unique expertise. With this unique skills set and institutional knowledge, and years of experience gained from helping community groups and people in general into effective advocacy organizations, NGOs are positioned to offer value and contribute towards the advancement of knowledge development while working on new frontier ideas and issues associated with human rights and the environment. In the last 20 years, we have succeeded in creating self-sustaining, dynamic national movement of rural people across the country capable of facilitating systemic change. Green advocates, for example, have supported the establishment of a network of local community organizations in all 15 of Liberia's counties, as well as a network of NGOs, activists, environmental and human rights defenders, labor unions, women groups, and indigenous people across West Africa that are capable of monitoring rights violations and pressing for reforms. Just this week, just this week, our colleagues in Guinea secured a massive victory against the government of Guinea before the Economic Community of West African Court of Justice. As we advance in the age of the Anthropocene, NGOs and the relationship they have nurtured based on hard-earned battles in the field with some of the poorest communities and frontline defenders in the world have the potential to rethink and unbundle our contemporary social contract, fundamental development hypotheses, economic edifice, sustainability construct, rule of law, and governance models. As I indicated, and now leave you with this thought, NGOs are continuously in the love-hate relationship with a diverse range of stakeholders. The Vi people of Liberia refer to such a relationship as a porcupine gut, too sour to chew, too sweet to chew up, no free meals, there's always a price to pay. Thank you.
I wanted to, I know we saw your internet was, was uh, the bandwidth was going down. Um, Justice Benjamin, are you um, connected? Yes, I am connected. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We can yeah, hear thank you. you. Welcome. Welcome. I'm going to disappear again. <laughs> thank you. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I'm delighted to, to be part of this um, Global Environmental Justice Conference. Many thanks for the organizers, especially for those that have done a lot of work behind the scenes, like Kristen contacting us many, many times, and uh, my dear and old friend, uh, Professor Gerald Torres, my colleagues in the panel, some of them I have known for quite uh, some time, including uh, Jim Silk. Uh, my presentation, uh, as I uh, discussed with Alfred, uh, should be second uh, because he would discuss the, um, environmental justice and, and, and the topic of our panel in a broader uh, perspective, environmental defenders, the role of NGOs in human rights conflicts. So I begin with the beginning. Uh, in the title of this panel, we, we have on one side environmental defenders, which is uh, a very broad term, doesn't connect us only with the courtroom, but an environmental defender is someone that I suppose uh, protects or tries to protect the environment anyway, including in the courtroom. And as Alfred mentioned in his experience, in fact, uh, the examples that he gave were outside of the courtroom. And that's why I am second, because I'll be focusing on the courtroom. In the second part of the title of this panel, we have the role of NGOs in human rights conflicts. So we begin with environmental defenders and then a connection with NGOs and human rights. It's important to, to mention that when we discuss environmental defenders, in many cases, we are not dealing with NGOs. So the opening of the title says more than the second part of it. NGOs are legal entities in many parts of, uh, of the world. In fact, they cannot sue unless they are uh, legally registered. And in authoritarian regimes, that registration is done by the government. So be careful, don't make the government unhappy because you might lose your registration and basically be disbanded. This is the death sentence for an NGO and it has happened in many parts of the world, including my own region, uh, Brazil, in Ecuador, not long time ago. In the second part of the, the title, we have the connection with human rights. And here, perhaps it's important to say, uh, it's the obvious, but we need sometimes to stress the obvious, that, the that there are environmental cases that would not qualify 100% as a human rights case. But in most situations, when we have environmental um, conflicts, we can phrase those conflicts within the picture or the box uh, of human rights uh, conflicts, especially because a number of constitutions in the world have uh, included environmental rights in conjunction with the so-called fundamental rights or human rights. And at the international level, we all know that this, and this is now uh, taken for granted, that the environmental rights are considered part uh, of the, um, the broader umbrella of, um, of human uh, rights. 
Of course, uh, the fact that we have in some constitutions this connection doesn't guarantee that the connection operates well in practice. And here, a parenthesis, every time I'm invited to give a talk uh, or a, uh, an address in a foreign country, I look at the national constitution. In the United States, I know that the national constitution doesn't say a word on the environment, but I was curious to see whether the constitution of Connecticut would say something about the environment. To my surprise, and I might be wrong, I might have overlooked it, I didn't find a provision protecting the environment as opposed to other state constitutions, but I did find a provision protecting Yale University, which I found fascinating. And I suppose this puts more environmental responsibilities on, on, on Yale, the faculty, the law professors, um, I'm sorry, the professors, uh, the law professors as well, the students, uh, the staff, because you are recognized by the constitution, uh, whereas the environment apparently it's not recognized. That's not the case in over 100 countries in which environmental rights are framed in the constitution, sometimes in vague terms, other times in very specific ter terms, and more recently in very specific terms, recognizing uh, Mother Earth, Pachamama, the case of Ecuador and, and Bolivia, uh, as a legal entity, a legal, a legal subject. That's all in terms of introduction and putting um, this panel in, 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 in the proper uh, context. Environmental defenders. And now I am in uh, not looking at environmental defenders at this stage. Later on, we'll come back. Uh, to that in the courtroom. The situation of environmental defenders around the world is quite dramatic. We have environmental groups, we have individuals uh, that are not just blocked from doing what democracies would expect from citizens, but they have been threatened, their families have been um, uh, threatened and in in a number of cases environmental defenders have been assassinated so it's important that we that live in in robust democracies uh, and we take for granted that exercising rights are part of uh, the the premise of being a democratic society that in a number of countries, this is not the case, and people are killed, are executed, are, are kidnapped, uh, their properties uh, destroyed, their families uh, have to flee because they are protecting the common good, they are protecting the environment, not just for themselves, not just for their families, for their tribes, for uh, their countries, but for the world and future generations. The other aspect that I would like to uh, to mention in those uh, 10 minutes of introduction is the direct connection between what we call the environment, environmental defenders and property rights. This is a topic that should permeate any discussion uh, that we have on environmental defenders because quite often environmental defenders are not direct defending directly the environment, but indirectly through uh, issues of land rights, land ownership, um, the strong against, uh, against the weak, and in that context, uh, the environment is, is part of. Other times, it's the opposite. It's a discussion on the environment, or it begins with this discussion on the environment and then uh, it has within it uh, uh, a debate on, on, on property rights. 
And in the last uh, few minutes I have in this introduction, let me explore a little bit more this second possibility. In other words, it's a discussion, clear discussion on the environment, but it comes with it the whole uh, range of property rights issues that uh, we tend often um, not to discuss uh, or to neglect in, in discussions or in debates uh, of this sort. And I'm glad that the chair of this panel is Professor Gerald Torres because he has written uh, extensively uh, on, on, on the subject of property rights and the environment, police power, um, this uh, uh, beautiful article, uh, and correct me, Gerald, if I'm wrong, uh, who owns either the air or the sky, I can't really remember, I think it's the sky, uh, which is a poetic way of asking a fundamental question in environmental uh, litigation. When we are in the context of environmental litigations, we uh, are faced with several uh, technicalities standing to sue, res judicata, statute of limitation, and, and several other uh, uh, technical uh, legal concepts that sound completely alien uh, and strange, directly from Mars uh, to an ordinary citizen. All those technical, formal, institutions have a, a direct or indirect link with the way we face property rights and we face the environment within the property rights umbrella that is in the constitution and in the civil code or um, legislation um, that addresses property rights uh, issues. For example, in standing to sue um, countries and the terminology uh, uh, varies uh, from one place to another, uh, we can say injury in fact, uh, in other uh, jurisdictions is something different. All this has to do with the nature of the environment. And here, let me list one or two contradictions of the legal system in, in that context. Let's begin with the definition, uh, although it doesn't show up as a definition, but we can extract a definition from those texts, um, from the, the provisions in constitutions that protect the environment. Usually it's granted to everyone, often to future generations as well, a right to a clean and safe environment. Other constitutions put an emphasis more on the green or the brown, uh, or the blue aspect of uh, the equation, but that's the basic formulation. And then other constitutions even add um, a property uh, language, and they say, you know, uh, which is considered a common good. Well, if the constitutions were to stop there, we could say, well, you know, we have to go back to um, to the legislation and see how this equation will play will play out. However, those constitutional provisions go further, and they say often that it's a duty not just of the state. And if they were to stop there again, we would have to do our research. Uh, not in within the constitutional framework, but but um, in the lower statutes. But they add those constitutional provisions add a phrase that is quite relevant. It's a duty of all citizens to protect the environment. So here we, you have a formulation of something that is at the same time a right and at the same time an obligation. And how can I comply as a citizen with those obligations if I am not allowed in the courtroom? 
So it, were, it would already be extraordinary and a contradiction to grant a right and close the door of the courtroom to the right holders. It's worse than that. We close the door also to those that have a duty to protect the environment. In other words, if it's a duty, it's a duty to protect the environment if you own property, but also if other people own property and the environment is being disturbed, destroyed, degraded, annihilated. So you can see that the formulation, the constitutional, the legal formulation of environmental rights and obligations do not fit the model that we have been using for ages for access to justice for conflicts that are directly linked to us as individuals or to our property or to our little uh, micro environment uh, where we live on. So as an introduction, I'm here not to uh, propose any any conclusion yet, but just to uh, to show that one, and I, I finish here, one that environmental defenders, the term goes much beyond environmental defenders in the courtroom but in the courtroom environmental defenders and environmental claims need to uh, take into account those new formulations that don't come from crazy law professors fringe areas of law but they come directly from constitutional um, uh, provisions language vocabulary and from laws that have been enacted by parliaments i stop here Now I'd like to um, have a conversation between the, the two of you uh, uh, as uh, um, uh, to follow out the the, uh, the the points you made, and then we'll bring the uh, the discussants uh, up as well. So I don't know if either of you have questions for one another. Um, if 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 not, we can uh, ask Jim uh, to join us, uh, and we can continue um, the discussion. Well, there, are, there are a couple of, uh, not questions, but a couple of, uh, of follow up. Um, we wanted to be able, I wanted to, to be able to allow us to ponder and to be, uh, to pursue in terms of trying to, to, uh, to understand, you know, this whole construct of, uh, you know, the idea of the, an environmental defendant and what it is, um, you know, Justice Antonio Benjamin, you know, um, had laid that, and the question is much more than just the environment. It's a whole construct of property rights that he advanced um, across West Africa, where I have worked, and and the defenders that I have worked with. Sometimes it's a whole idea of well, who is the def who is the defender. Uh, who is the environmental defender? In fact, uh, currently my research work, I'm looking at 16 countries focusing on frontline grassroots defenders. Those issues have come out. Um, annually, um, the, uh, the international organization Global Witness you know, published the report of defenders who are threatened, who are rise, and who are murdered. 
And there's been the question of the whole idea of underreporting. So um, taking the idea of the property rights, we have a situation where most of the defenders, those we consider as defenders and frontline defenders, um, come from indigenous communities and um, exist in a property right dynamics that is not defined by the so-called statutory process. We live in a dual legal regime where one construct of property right is customary right based on historical ancestral practices. And one construct is statutory. But even in that statutory arrangement, property rights is not the kind of physical assets or attribution that you see is in the realm of the collective rights. So what an indigenous defender or, or environmental defender would see as property uh, on his land and on his water or in his forest would be viewed as defending his culture, his custom, his religion, his spirituality, his history, his entrepreneurship. So that just tied to that physical aspect of what the property right really is. And we face questions of how courts have responded to that because court falls within a separate realm, which is biased more towards the statutory because it is the so-called elite who define what the rights are. The so-called westernized education who define what the rights are, what is in the constitution, and often ignore the existing indigenous customary practices. So there is a challenge for how uh, environmental defenders who exist within that customary or indigenous arrangement fit into that construct of the, 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 uh, the Eurocentric constitutional interpretation of what the environment really is. And there's a need to unpackage that. And the way we've pursued that across West Africa is a combination of the things I'm talking about. Um, you know, uh, building resistance to challenge that construct because in no way does it represent them. In any way, in fact, it undermines the existing right. That is why government following the quote unquote constitution who gave away rights of indigenous land to transnational corporations, not respecting those rights. Because in their mindset, first and foremost, those defenders live in primitive civilizations and societies. Their religion, their spirituality, their gods are much more smaller. They are not fully accounted. And one will sit down and you will give title to a transnational corporation has a least whole rights that will allow them to go into indigenous communities land and extinguish pre-existing rights more often than have pre-existed even the funding of the country itself. So there's a need to rethink those processes in terms of how we set that in the construct of what the environment really is. And that's how when we try to define who the defender is, we go beyond those boundaries of the quote unquote, what is defined in the constitution, what is defined in the statute and try to accommodate what has existed within those uh, uh, indigenous communities. So there's a need to understand these differences to figure out where do we put that burden and how do we ensure the full protection of defenders who, even though it rely on the state apparatus, do not fully protect them. Uh, Antonio, the, you face similar kinds of challenges in Brazil, but also the Organization of American States has recognized some indigenous claims, even though they're not uh, exist, they don't exist squarely within the framework of the the country, or with, even within the framework of the of the of the Constitution. So, how do you negotiate those kinds of of, of issues? You're muted. So first of all, uh, Jared, let me make 
a brief comparison between Latin America and, and West Africa. Uh, it, it would apply also to East Africa and Southern Africa uh, as well. In, in Africa, one can say that most countries, and, and Alfred, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, from the many visits and, and, and working in Africa, uh, I would say that most countries do recognize some sort of customary law, especially in respect to biodiversity, to water rights, but to land itself. And then you have this uh, uh, this um, shock uh, between customary uh, law and um, laws that are passed by um, by the national or state uh, parliaments that contradict uh, the basic tenets uh, of those um, um, uh, of those customary laws. And in some countries, especially in West Africa, you have customary courts. Uh, in, in some countries, those customary courts can go all the way uh, to a sort of Supreme Court level. But in most countries, those cases are then, uh, they merge at the Supreme Court and they, uh, the customary aspect of those cases sort of um, uh, are weakened. In Latin America, we speak in general terms as Latin American law, but we cannot in respect to customary law because there are countries in which customary law, even customary courts exist for Indian rights like Bolivia and others where we don't have, uh, in fact, it's in the legislation that customs are not uh, are completely um, uh, stopped by whatever law that is uh, is enacted. So it uh, the prevalence is to statutory laws as opposed to customary laws. That's the case of Brazil, that's Argentina, Chile, um, and and I suppose others that I'm not that that familiar with. So this is a difference between um, the two um, continents. Uh, so, so to speak. For us judges, it's very complicated. Uh, but it's very complicated because we judges make it complicated. For example, the recognition uh, that some parts of the environment might have religious importance. This might sound a little bit bizarre to, you know, to the formalistic judge. Uh, however, until five decades ago or six decades ago, uh, someone in Brazil could write a will and leave part of his or her properties to one of the saints, to the Virgin Mary, for example. I was not aware of this until recently, in, two, three years ago, one of those old cases for a technical par uh, particularity came to, to me. And I, I saw that, I said, this is very strange. And I almost recused myself because the saint involved was Saint Anthony. So a property that was left in the first half of the 20th century to Saint Anthony. And as you know, I'm Antonio. <laughs> I didn't, but this shows that um, the recognition by the legal system of some of those aspects that are basic tenets in customary uh, laws, um, the, 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 the barriers sometimes are built by us judges. They are part of the legal tradition, but we, uh, in a very formalistic manner, we are expelling, uh, sometimes without knowing, those notions that, that are crucial. Uh, for example, um, perhaps the best way in, in which we can, that we can use as an analogy are our <clears throat> seminaries uh, and the, uh, the, 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 the very peculiar nature of cemeteries in, in, in our legal systems. 
So we take that for granted, but we, we don't accept that uh, an indigenous people or tribe or group has a mountain in which they consider uh, sacred. That would be a perversion of the legal system. But it's a perversion of the legal system because it's not within the boundaries of the official religion or the, re the religion of the majority. I don't know if I answered uh, your question or I made it more complicated than it sounds. Um, um, Gerard, just uh, one minute, just to, I just wanted to, 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 to dive in there. And I definitely yeah. understand the balancing uh, that uh, uh, Justice Benjamin has brought in here. But then this brings us back to our, our key conversation about the role of NGOs that exist with the state and how it allows for this contentious relationship. Because some of those contentious relationships brought us on some of the issues we are talking about now. Exactly. You know, addressing property rights and how NGOs are intervening. And a lot of times you say it's the NGOs that intervene to try to address those issues, protecting defenders who may have multiple different claims and how you balance those claims. So, for example, uh, you're talking about East Africa, you know, um, you know um, how uh, the defender will view a river, right? And how the state will view that river. So, the state designated that river has a, uh, um, a natural reserve, a heritage, a protected area. And they want to protect the pelicans and they want to ensure that tourists will come to a country like Kenya to view and see the pelicans. That is the value to which the state sus subscribe that rights. The communities who live in that area for centuries that pre-existed view the lake as a religious site that they want to continue worshiping. So how do you balance those different rights, those different bonnets of rights? It's the same thing we see in West Africa, how indigenous people look at the forest, my country in Liberia, the tribes see the forest as their god. And to a so-called Western person who had Western education, and this is the conceptualization that most government make when they are giving out mineral rights. There are billions of dollar value of minerals beneath the mountains. There are billions of dollar worth of resources in the timber and the, and the logs. And the government want to extract that for the so-called development of the country. This is a spiritual value for the indigenous people. How do you value that? That allows for the sort of conflict that exists and how NG and NGOs have to work a dedicate uh, uh, a delicate balance in engaging the indigenous people, trying to balance that and seeing how, in the terms of what I described in my presentation. Uh, doing evidence-based research, uh, advancing policy formulations, using strategic litigation, and ensuring that even as you engage the governments and you engage the transnational corporations, you are able to sit down and find a way to find a balancing. You can work together and say, okay, we now need to incorporate these rights of indigenous people. We've done that in Liberia. So for example, we now have legislation that has elevated customary land rights to the same status as private property rights. So whether or not indigenous people can show a deed or not a deed, their rights are fully guaranteed. And no more now can the government sit down and issue leasehold rights to extinguish existing indigenous rights in those areas here. And in that way, the value that the indigenous people have subscribed to the forest has been their spiritual value, will now allow for that protection of the forest. The sort of work that I did in West Africa, where I protected 500 million hectares of forest land, was based on the rights of the communities who said, "We, this is our shrine. This is our God. We worship this. We can. We should not destroy this." And so, by protecting, and this is the the relationship between human rights and the environment, by protecting the rights of the indigenous people to their forest land. You now have preserved one of the more pristine forests across the region. So it is this dedicated balance that we have to manage in terms of how and you and give these arrangements. Yeah, the, we we face here in the United States similar similar problems. One of the uh, and similar uh, uh, inability under our legal system to make the kind of balance that you've uh, outlined. The um, 
the uh, Bears Ears National Monument was actually an example of bringing uh, indigenous claims to the table in a way that uh, were put on an equal par with private interests in order to preserve uh, the Bears Ears space. So they, uh, the, uh, that process is, is in some ways is almost novel in the United States because uh, indigenous claims are not given the same legal weight, uh, um, uh, especially religious claims over, uh, over natural uh, uh, formations. Um, what, what I'd like to do now um, is to invite uh, uh, Jim and, and Tim uh, to, uh, to the discussion, uh, and we'll bring up uh, uh, the co-convener, Amity Doolittle, uh, after that. She uh, is an expert in this area as well. And so, um, Jim, I'd like to turn it over to you, and I will step off the stage uh, and uh, let the discussion continue. Uh, thanks, Gerald. Um, well, as others have, let me start by by thanking the organizers and sponsors, and and particularly Amity and and Gerald and and Kristen for inviting me. And and it really is a particular honor for me to comment on remarks by Alfred, who's been our visiting fellow for the last uh, year and a half or so, and and uh, the remarks of Justice Benjamin. Um, with whom I've had the privilege of working on the Oslo principles of global climate obligations. Um, and it's also a pleasure to team up a bit with, with Tim, uh, who's our student in the Lowenstein Clinic and um, working with the Alfred on a project. Um, before I start my remarks, I just wanted to enter this last discussion a little bit, um, and then I'll, then I'll be speak more generally. But I just want to give two examples of of some of what uh, particularly what Alpha was just talking about, and that's the um, the Inter American Court of Human Rights, which has kind of developed a somewhat creative approach to recognizing the rights of indigenous peoples and particularly the importance of their connection to their traditional lands and and how that uh, ends up being part of their rights, and it's done this partly through kind of uh, interpreting the right to life as including the right to a, a life of dignity, la vida digna, and um, using that as a tool uh, to protect indigenous communities' rights. And also um, the, the Constitutional Court of Colombia, um, which has a couple of important cases in which it created kind of a doctrine that recognizes the authority of indigenous communities to govern their affairs on the basis of customary law, but with some exception if those come into conflict with what the court calls fundamental rights, which is not all human rights, but some subset of those considered fundamental. For example, if it comes into conflict with the right to life. Um, so I, I think those are just interesting examples of finding ways to, to achieve that balance. Um, I wanted to start by saying a little bit about my background, just to the extent that it affects my perspective on the issues we're talking about. So first of all, I teach in the law school, but I teach an international human rights clinic. Um, I'm not primarily a scholar. I teach human rights advocacy, and we do human rights advocacy around a, a pretty wide array of issues and using a pretty wide array of methods, but we also, work pretty hard to interrogate to interrogate human rights practice critically. Um, we have done work on the human rights consequences of climate change, um, including now on a project with Alfred. And as I mentioned, I was a member of the expert group uh, with Justice Benjamin um, that drafted the Oslo principles. Um, I might talk about that a bit more later. But also it's important, I think, to my perspective on the role of human rights and the role of law, that I went to law school when I was 39 years old, um, and I came to law school from human rights work. And I think that affects the way I see the role of law. Um, I wasn't completely sure what the focus of this panel was, um, so I thought I'd take off a little bit from where yesterday's panels left things, um, and a couple things in particular. 
Dan Esty noted three forms of justice, justice between states, between individuals, and between generations. Uh, human rights are generally viewed as being about the claims of justice by individuals against states. But I think it's evolved and has something to say about all three of those justice relationships that Dan Esty talked about. And then second, Michaela's reference, which I think was a real bridge to this panel, to the role of activists mobilizing people to put pressure on governments and institutions to make change that produces more justice and more well-being. So I, I want to say a few things about three themes that I hope sort of bring together some of these things. And in a way, I'm going to zoom out uh, from Alfred's focus on, on kind of the particular uh, activism and relationships in, in West Africa and, and the role of NGOs there to the role of NGOs more broadly in the global north and the global south, and also zooming out from Justice Benjamin's focus on, on law and courts. So the themes I want to briefly address are, in a very general way, the role of NGOs in promoting human rights and protecting environmental defenders, uh, and some critique of that. Then the role of human rights in efforts to address climate change. And finally, kind of bringing some of this together, the role of NGOs um, in climate and climate uh, work, but relative to the role of states and international institutions, which we discussed yesterday. So first of all, I'd, I'd say in a very general way, NGOs have been the engine of most advances in human rights, whether it's the establishment of new human rights instruments or efforts to increase compliance and hold violators accountable. But there's a, a pretty wide view these days by critics and within human rights that human rights is at a crossroads. And that crossroads is characterized by a number of criticisms um, and, and new challenges. So I want to talk first about what are the means of human rights, both generally and in defense of human rights and environmental defenders. And I put those two together because I think in some ways they're inseparable. Um, so first, I think what people are familiar with so-called naming and shaming, and that's the documentation uh, of abuses, publicizing them, creating pressure on decision makers who have the ability to create pressures on those who are violating. Um, and that's been the core of international, mostly Northern-based human rights NGOs. And second, just the drawing of attention to human rights and environmental defenders to make it a little more difficult for the powerful forces that feel threatened by them to hurt and silence them. Third, um, campaigning to create public pressure. This has been the traditional method of Amnesty International. Fourth, litigation in domestic courts under domestic and international law, and that depends on the nature of domestic legal systems. And that's the invoking in the context of defending defenders of a number of relevant rights, the right to life, the right to freedom of expression, the right to freedom of assembly, to participate in public life, to be free of arbitrary detention, right to fair process, and then also more broadly, the rights of indigenous peoples um, and the right <clears throat> to a standard of health. Also advocacy with international institutions, including the United Nations and, and its human rights entities, regional human rights systems and regional courts, but also using the means of those institutions, which I would describe as tepid means, the weak means, um, to press states for compliance. And, and then finally, I would say there's a role that Northern NGOs play in sometimes, and, and Southern NGOs as well, in capacity building helping governments that are actually seeking to do better. So what are, what are some of the key critiques of human rights? There's a growing list of them these days, and I think all have some truth. I'm, I'm talking to some extent now about critiques mostly from the left, um, but I, I'm just gonna list them really. I, I'm not gonna respond to them, but I will say a few things about ways in which I, I think we can respond to them. So first, the failure of human rights to prevent mass atrocities, including genocide in recent decades, and, and generally the failure to improve people's enjoyment of human rights. 
The sense that human rights are a global north imposition of Western liberal values, and to some, they're even seen as kind of a codependent with and a, and a sustaining of neoliberalism. And the basic post-war compromise that agreed on having strong human rights norms, but weak institutions, weak means of enforcement. The success of the human rights movement in promulgating new standards and incorporating human rights into national law, but less success in terms of bringing about enforcement and compliance of those laws. Some see it as a form of hegemony, a moral language that pushes aside other potential emancipatory languages and approaches. It's viewed as an elite um, uh, domain that's disconnected from social movements. It's over-legalized and over-professionalized. There's the idea that, um, uh, that both the idea of human rights and its norms, its legal norms, are minimalist, and they have been from the outset, that they set mere sufficiency standards, not standards for equality. And so it's unequipped to do anything about the most important issue facing the world, growth, wealth inequality, both within and among states. Another criticism is that it, human rights relies too much on states as protectors of human rights, and it pays attention only to obligations of states to individuals, not the obligations of important non-state actors, militias, armed movements, criminals, corporations, Sometimes they're the same. Uh -huh. And a concern that I've written about a little bit, and that's the overemphasis within human rights on international criminal justice as a means of protection. It's expensive, it's retrospective, it focuses on individual perpetrators, not on systems. It's the most elite form of, of <clears throat> activity in human rights. The institutions are remote from the people and they will always deal only with the most egregious abuses in a small number of places. So what are some current challenges to human rights? Not criticisms, but new challenges. Well, the one that gets talked about a lot is this tendency toward authoritarian populism um, that we've seen in the United States, in Brazil, um, in, in countries of, of Eastern and Central Europe and others which has tendencies toward nationalism, racism, sexism, the undermining of the rule of law and democratic institutions, and a disdain for science. Another is the reassertion, somewhat successfully in recent years, of old notions of national sovereignty. China has been a particular champion of that. There's also a sense that the bread and butter method of documentation, research, publicizing, elite advocacy, is no longer responsible to a world of instant information, social media, where the lack of effective pressure to stop human rights abuses is not about a lack of knowledge of the abuse, but about a lack of the political will, the will to incur the cost of action. And the last couple are the, are the growing global wealth inequality, climate change effects on human rights, and the place of structural racism in human rights abuse in the sense that human rights has, has largely been irrelevant to the movements against racism. I'm not gonna respond to all of these, but I wanna make a few points in response. First, I strongly believe that a lot of the critics who write about this are scholars, and they tend to see it from a very limited perspective. They themselves are overly legalistic. They tend to see human rights as being about its formal institutions, and about the big well-known NGOs of the global north. What are they missing? They're missing the development of strong NGOs in the global south, working locally like, like Alfred's group, the Green Advocates and, and the groups they work with, using international and domestic law and courageously pushing political limits to demand accountability, justice and rights. For the global NGOs, I think the last couple of decades have also been a time of real self-criticism and in particular, there's been a less top-down approach, less of the elites dictating, in a sense, to the global south, and real partnerships with, and even, I would say, taking the lead from NGOs in the global south. One thing about the formal institutions, 
the special proce special procedures of the United Nations, the special rapporteurs, the working groups on country situations and on thematic issues have brought real creativity into these somewhat stodgy formal institutions. They've mustered resources and they've sought ways to overcome a kind of diplomatic crippling of international scrutiny and other forms of intervention for human rights. And most important, and, and this is always kind of at the heart of my teaching about human rights, I think the real value of human rights law in its now 70 year history has never been in its formal institutions or in enforcement through law. It's been in providing people with a clear language that people, communities, and movements can use to make demands for their rights for justice. And for the most part, those have been political demands, not in, in the legal fora, but the power of that language derives from the standards having been legitimated as law. Their legal obligations states have agreed to. They're not just contested moral claims. So I wanna talk now briefly about climate change. Human rights NGOs have been pretty slow in embracing the need to address the human rights consequences of climate change. But human rights ideas and obligations have been at the heart of civil society efforts to address climate change and its effects and to seek climate justice. So just a few points. Um, yesterday, Professor Bodansky really brilliantly exposed this complexity of the different approaches to interstate climate justice. And then Professor Esty and Michaela emphasized justice for people, whether in terms of uh, the uneven effects uh, among different people of climate change or between generations. Human rights speaks to the obligations to people. And unlike justice, which is a rather vague term, human rights provides very specific and concrete obligations. Also thinking about yesterday, with powerful states, I believe, unlikely to put justice above national interests, particularly powerful states, or even put it on an equal footing with national interests, combined with the tendency of powerful states to base their policy decisions and international actions on a rather short-sighted conception of national interests, the pressure for climate action and climate justice will continue to come largely from civil society and NGOs. So it raises the question whether there's a possibility that perhaps in some contrast, I think, to human rights, there's reason to believe that progress on climate change and climate justice will come from courts enforcing existing law, largely human rights law, rather than from further international negotiation and agreements and domestic legislation. We see cases, Alfred mentioned a recent ruling in the ECOWAS, um, there's a case before the Supreme Court of Norway that our clinic um, submitted an amicus brief for, brought by the Young Friends of the Earth of Norway and by Greenpeace against the government of Norway for licensing new oil drilling in the Barents Sea and thus violating the rights of people today and to people of future generations. And it's based on violating their human rights. And the last thing I want to say about about these responses, and then I'll just make a few last points about the role of NGOs relative to international institutions. There's this potential utility of soft law. We don't often talk about this. What is soft law? Well, they're kind of principles and things that are out there. They're, they may be uh, declarations of institutions like the General Assembly or the Human Rights Council, or they may be expert uh, developed principles. And that's often the form they take, authoritative principles articulated by experts that claim to codify and interpret existing legal principles. And there's a history of this in human rights. There are the Johannesburg principles on freedom of expression, the Maastricht principles on states' extraterritorial obligations, the Limburg principles on the implementation of economic and social rights, and there are others. They're not binding, but they're expert statements of the content of existing law, and that forms kind of soft law. 
principles that may gain authority and be available to judges in interpreting existing legal obligations in new contexts. And that's what the Oslo principles seek to do. Um, their foundation is largely in human rights obligations. So a couple final points about NGOs. Both uh, Dan Bodansky and, and Dan Esty talked about international conferences and negotiations, Rio and, and things like that, and how they have given greater voice to civil society. Well, I think that's true in a kind of quantitative way. NGOs have been present in enormous numbers at the world conferences, and they've, they've certainly provided enormous amount of input into the processes. But I, I question the, the real significance of this kind of procedural involvement of NGOs, what its real impact is. It's a kind of consultative process um, where the actors, the powerful actors, can kind of take the consultation or leave it. So how meaningful is that kind of participation in the face of powerful interests, uh, particularly of states and corporations? Dan Esty said, we need to see climate principles permeate all international institutions, the international financial institutions, the WTO, the WHO, others. I think that's right. In a way, human rights has provided at least a start on this, and I would say even something of a model under pressures from NGOs, both human rights and environmental NGOs, uh, the World Bank, others um, have established principles and standards for their projects, their funding to comply with uh, on the basis of human rights and environmental standards and have created accountability mechanisms. And I think we need to see the role of those kinds of things grow. But I think there's already a lot there uh, that if um, groups um, um, rely on can hold some of those institutions accountable for the environmental uh, effects of their work. So I guess just in conclusion, I, uh, one statement and one question I'd like to throw out um, for discussion. So I think human rights NGOs will continue to engage in the work that's been at the heart <coughs> of their mission, <coughs> and that's defending generating attention to, representing, collaborating with environmental and human rights defenders. But they will also seek increasingly to adapt their means and address climate change and particularly its human rights harms. And the question I'd like to really ask us to think about is, where is the most valuable place to invest our efforts to promote environmental justice? Is it in international ne negotiations and more treaty making? Is it in domestic courts uh, invoking existing law, particularly human rights law? Is it in multi-stakeholder cooperative endeavors that, that Alfred talked about a little bit? Um, is it in rights-based political mobilizing domestically or transnationally? I think it's easy to give the answer, yes, all of the above. Um, obviously that's true in a way, but I'd really like to think about where the greatest potential lies given our, given our experience um, in human rights. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I have some comments, some questions I can bring to this discussion, but so that we don't let that question um, Go, go away. I was wondering if um, Justice Benjamin and Professor Brownell, if you had any comments you wanted to offer in response to Professor Silk's question. Alfred. Well, if Alfred is not speaking, I I will begin, Jim, with your last um, uh, question, uh, which is the direct question that you asked uh, the two of us. Uh, although in your presentation you had implicit questions uh, that uh, you you didn't address yourself, but you just pose uh, pose them in in the summary of the criticism. Uh, of human rights in general and, and, and the work done by a human rights uh, organization. 
I think um, it's relevant to stress that uh, what we call NGOs in 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 countries around the world uh, vary uh, a lot. Uh, we have often not non-governmental organizations, but non-governmental individuals that are organized as an NGO. Uh, this is so common in in uh, in the environmental context, um, um, where you have NGOs, but it's basically one person that is um, has to be organized in order in order to play. Uh, the role in in those official functions, including uh, in in the courtroom. So we cannot make an assessment that uh, applies to everywhere in the world, not even to every place in a single country, like like mine, which is a continental uh, country like the United States. Uh, so this is the first premises to any analysis of the difficulties and also of the opportunities. Resources are very limited, human resources and financial resources. Uh, the risks for NGOs and for individuals, for environmental defenders in general, um, uh, vary even within uh, one single country. Uh, in one state, uh, you have more freedom in other uh, states you have less less freedom. So I would not be able to say um, where uh, to invest more. Uh, it depends on the circumstances and the opportunities. I think NGOs should be, uh, and I use uh, the term in, in a good sense, opportunistic, seeing uh, where uh, their work will, will have the biggest impact uh, in consideration of the limited resources uh, that that they have. I would also say that what plays in, in one context might not play in, the other, in another context. Namely, uh, an avenue that's probably the best or the most effective one for climate change might not be the best one for biodiversity protection and vice versa. Biodiversity tend, uh, tends to be more um, linked to the ground as opposed to climate change that is per se, per nature, something that is global and you cannot forget entirely the global, uh, the global perspective. Um, and in the case of climate, ch um, of biodiversity protection, for example, often what do you see is looking at what's happening in a particular area and then linking that area to the global stage, for example, through the chain of suppliers all the way uh, to the kitchen of the consumer. So those strategies depend not just on, on, on uh, the type of issue that the NGO is focusing on, but on the opportunities that, 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 that exist. Finally, um, in respect to uh, litigation, there are other components here that make uh, any assessment even more uh, uh, difficult because the rules for standing to sue vary from country to country. Uh, the cultural uh, diversity also plays a role. And in some countries, the fact that you have an NGO, uh, an international NGO as a litigant, as a plaintiff is irrelevant. Whereas uh, in other places where you have an international NGO might in fact play uh, uh, against um, uh, the, uh, the possibilities uh, of success of, um, uh, of those uh, claims. So sorry, I don't have an answer. It's it's more of some precautions that we might take, and 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 make sure that uh, and, and NGOs do this. They assess uh, the opportunities, and then they see what we have.
and and the possibility that I mean, um, some of the goals that uh, they have in mind. Okay, um, just to quickly, to quickly jump in here um, and to respond to uh, some of the issues that have uh, been uh, raised here. Um, I think the, the, we don't have a silver bullet here, right? We don't have a silver bullet here. Um, but I think uh, it's also important that in terms of addressing the issues of the defenders um, across the board and what they face with, first and foremost, we have to realize, and based on my own experience and who I define to who a defender really is, that these are the folks who are at the front line these are the folks who identify as our firewall, right? I'm talking about uh, indigenous leaders who are in remote towns and villages who are standing up to massive deforestations, to pollution of the water sources, to desecration of the sacred sites, to massive displacement that is going on, sanctioned by the government, and implemented by transnational corporations. These are folks who um, you never ever get to hear their names. You never ever get to see them. I call them the so-called faceless and nameless. Um, and uh, um, it's important that the sort of work that we do strengthen that firewall. So they continue to advance this sort of way. So there isn't a silver bullet. And so my, the approach that we utilize across West Africa is building these networks, right, of these so-called faceless and nameless, empowering and strengthening them to ensure that they can deliver on it. Now, here is the problem that we are faced with. Lest we forget where we are, and just taking up from what Jean said, we are in the age of the Anthropocene. In the age of the Anthropocene, the so-called constructs of sustainability does not apply. The so-called constructs of stare decisis does not apply. And in fact, this is what I said in my initial uh, uh, intervention. There is a need for rethinking those fundamentals because it is those fundamentals that have uh, uh, allowed us to arrive to where we are now at this tipping point. So um, we shouldn't sit there thinking about, well, is it very clear what are the standing rules? What is standing? You're talking about allowing standing for someone to come and address a claim when in the next 10, 15, 20 years, the pen is going to burn up. We have to rethink that standing. Those are absolute rules and theories of law that should not apply in this age of the Anthropocene. We have to rethink those concepts and go beyond just the construct of constitutional processes. I'm sorry for those who are straight, you know, as a lawyer who are, who are straight, you know, uh, textual uh, and analysts within the law. So we have to go back and figure out what is that right? We can keep waiting on to figure out what the so-called policy prescription will allow for us going to the legislature and waiting for them to that bakery. Why? the Amazon and the upper Guinea forest and the Congo Basin is being destroyed, where tons and tons of carbon is released into the air and governments are not taking any action to address those, where defenders who are defending people and the planet are being murdered at the rate of four per week. And you are waiting to allow for them to have standing to go to court to address those issues. And this is where the investment needs to be made at the level of those communities. And we also have to come back and rethink some of us who are involved in the international processes, the big NGOs, Amnesty, Greenpeace, because we are playing the same game that the corporations are playing, that the World Bank is playing. You want to establish an Amnesty International office in Liberia, in, in, in Kenya, in Brazil, when they are existing, local organization that you could strengthen. And you're not doing that. You want to manage them instead of trying to empower them to advance the work. Who is better placed to deliver on these processes? 
And this is where the investment needs to be made. And then to funding organization and institutions. A donor is figuring out how to provide funding to an indigenous community person who is fighting a massive transnational operation. You have $2.7 billion investment in oil palm, in mining, that these folks are confronting. And yet, if you want to have access to resources, you set up a bureaucratic system where they have to apply for, for funding and, uh, and support to advance their work. We have to rethink that whole arrangement. In this age of the Anthropocene, the existing system has completely failed us. And we have to agree to that. We have a fair us, and we can rely on it. Keep going back and live into an obsolete, archaic root of system that allows us to come here. We're not delivering on this. So we've got to rethink the whole thing just for human rights and advancing those persons where we now focus at that bottom level, where those who are confronting the firewall we are building, we hold that up to advance this whole represent. And that's where I think the investment needs to be made. And not just in one process, we have to deploy an array of tools to advance this. Going to the court, domestic courts, pursuing regional human rights systems, advancing alternative dispute resolutions, and as Jim said, taking advantage of multilateral development banks that are advancing public resources involved in destructive development. Because it is those public financing that is causing a toll on defenders who are trying to put those. So in West Africa, a massive oil and gas pipeline funded by the international finance corporations, which is taxpayers' money, destroying the environment and allowing for, 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 for dictators to go after and, and murder defenders, we cannot allow for that. And by putting the resources in the hands of those who are in the front line, we are now also empowering the people because we have realized at this point that the social contract has failed us. You don't need a rocket scientist to tell you that the system we have now that exists, that allows for only the 1% to control more than 70% of the wealth of the planet is a system that works for us. You can allow that system where people pretend that they are voting for their lawmakers and those lawmakers are financed by big businesses that they are going to be accountable to you. So we got to figure out how to, to rethink that, to dismantle that process and take resources and put it at the head of the people. We need to build the resistance. We need public uprising to challenge this system that is not delivering on human rights, on the environment, on sustainability, on poverty, on racial justice, on equality, and even on the so-called democracy we are talking about. Instead of us, so we can, we, we can figure out that, oh yes, no, we are lawyers, let's think about the law is, we, 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 we're trying to avoid, not to, not to disrupt the existing precedent set up by law, when in fact it is that very system that has not entrapped us and not allowed us to deliver. And we are facing these things. Look around the world. See the amount of poverty. See the amount of turmoil that people are faced with. Because the so-called idea of constructing this system has not really delivered us. I remember you know, a few, a few, a few years ago, we we're talking about property rights, and someone said, Well, you know, we have very clear defined property rights. Well, whether it is this thing. And I said, Have you forgotten on how we arrived at that right to property? The so called fee simple rights. Go back to New England and figure out how the aristocrats serve that right to property. They would not hold on to to be fee simple. Poor were evicted. That's how the poor came to the new world. Who had their rights were taken by the aristocrat. We now live on that right. And that's why when you go back and, and you work with indigenous people, they tell you what this is it's a collective arrangement. Got to rethink that. So not just the physical value is their religion, is their history, is their tradition, is their is their custom, is their entrepreneurship, is their livelihood. It's a total embodiment we're talking about. And that's why when you cut down the tree or you destroy a forest or you pollute a river, you're not just harming the physical properties of that river. 
You are having more than just the physical property. And so when defenders stand up in the indigenous community to defend the river, it's more than just the physical property. It's important that we empower them at that level, put the resources there at that level. And we do not repeat the whole imperialist agenda for those of us who are international organizations to say, oh, I'm going to set up an office in West Africa, in East Africa, in North America, instead of trying to empower those who are on the ground. I think this is what the problem already is. Because we're repeating the same mistake that we accuse all of. Alfred, thank you so, so much for that. Um, um, I'll tell you right now that if you are running for president, um, everyone who's on this call would vote for you. So you have tremendous, tremendous support from the group uh, who have been listening to you and um, are encouraged by your, well, encouraged and of course also uh, um, troubled by your words. Um, I want to uh, give Tim a chance to have his remarks and then maybe um, hear from uh, some questions from the audience if we can. I want to make one short interjection before I do so. And, and I think this is one of the things that I've struggled with for a long time. What, what I'm hearing, so I'm an anthropologist and I study property rights and native customary law from an anthropological perspective. And I feel that there is a huge disjuncture, um, sort of a gap, an epistemic uh, miscommunication between anthropologists and legal scholars and people living on the ground. Um, and I think our biggest challenge to answer Jim's question is how do we find ways to effectively bridge the basically epistemic communities that can't communicate using the same language. We have such different languages for describing the experiences and the solutions that we, we, we fail to figure out the new approach, which as Alfred suggests, is basically we need to have a transformational revolution and, and, and uh, re restart with new structures. Um, but anyhow, I, Tim, uh, on that note, <laughs> I wanna give you a moment to share your remarks and then we'll, we'll see, obviously this conversation could go on for weeks, if not months, but uh, uh, please, Tim. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, thanks so much to the organizers of the conference and um, all the other very accomplished people on, on this stage. Um, so I found this really, really thought provoking. So I wanted to point to a couple of questions in thinking of how we can make the most of, of human rights and NGOs, because I think there is a real unique potential there, but there, there are some risks. Um, so I've, as we've mentioned, NGO is such a diverse term from giant international organizations to very small community organizations. And, but I think a, a common theme is that, um, is there's a question around legitimacy and representativeness and accountability that NGOs have to pay careful attention to getting right. Because often states cannot or will not provide representation to groups, NGOs can fill that gap. But at the same time, if you take um, an organization like Greenpeace or Human Rights Watch, who exactly does this NGO represent? Is it its staff, its donors, the communities uh, on whose behalf it seeks um, to represent? But if it failed those communities, how would it be held accountable? Um, and I think that's uh, accentuated in, in global organizations, but including um, even local organizations. No community is homogenous. How do we determine what voices um, are, are representative? Um, but looking, so I think that's, that's a challenge in how NGOs can address that. But looking at the potential of NGOs too, I think they are a rare opportunity for transnational solidarity and cooperation. And if we look at some of the challenges um, we've been looking at today, especially environmental challenges, they just cannot be resolved within a single state. Despite the fact that um, our world and law is often very state-centric, these environmental challenges are not. If you're looking at the role of multinational corporations, often they're intensely local effects, um, but rooted in, in global causes. And, um, transnational networks can get at um, those both sides of, of those um, transnational networks in a way other organizations cannot. And the climate change, of course, um, where perhaps the greatest tragedy is that those who are least responsible for it will, will suffer the, the worst effects. Um, but especially looking at those communities in um, low-income countries in the global south, um, they have very little say in the um, you know, the democratic states of high emitting countries or rich countries and even their own governments have little say um, on the international stage. So NGOs are a way of bringing power on a transnational basis 
um, to, to respect those rights. But as um, Professor Brownell really powerfully stated, um, NGOs are not always fulfilling that purpose. They often um, fall into the same biases of not, um, not providing representation, not uh, where funding is concentrated in, in the global north. Um, so I, I wanted to just pose that question of, how can we make um, NGOs that work effectively to build transnational solidarity without falling into these pitfalls? Um, but especially how most of us here are in the global north right now. Um, how can we effectively partner and work in solidarity with organizations um, in the global south who are on the front lines of these environmental challenges? Well, Tim. Uh, Amity, can I begin? Yeah who, yeah, who is chairing? Is it Amity? Okay, so uh, Tim, you, you, <laughs> your intervention um, brings a number of, of issues. Let me uh, focus just on two of them. Uh, the first is the naive uh, perception that we uh, have to avoid uh, that ethical um, issues uh, do not exist uh, within the uh, NGO community. NGOs are human entities. Wherever you have humans, you are not going to have, um, um, you know, saints. You might have a Dalai Lama here, um, uh, uh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta there, but we are all human beings. And, and, uh, that said, what we need to um, um, uh, to keep um, in mind is that NGOs, because of their position in society, perhaps they have higher levels of expectations in respect to ethical behavior. One could say that this is not eth that, that, that this would not be fair, because for those that play against human rights. Uh, it's fine if they say whatever they want and they do whatever they want uh, and they can still be accepted in the courtroom, on, on TV shows, uh, in, in congressional hearings, but NGOs do have a higher bar in, in, in respect to ethical um, obligations. But I do believe that precisely, and this is your second uh, the second part of your, your observations, precisely because the legitimacy of NGOs is so vague, it's not directly linked to uh, an, an election or to an appointment. Uh, uh, perhaps that's one of the reasons why this ethical bar uh, should be higher than what we expect for other actors in, in, in the political um, arena. My final comment uh, has to do with uh, uh, the fact that NGOs are often uh, directed by the funding that they get. So they have a very nice uh, statutes, bylaws, they have a wonderful board, but at the end of the day, it will depend on um, the, the, the obligations that come either expressly stated or implicit that come with the type of funding um, that they, uh, they receive. So that said, perhaps uh, those NGOs that that have a more diluted uh, funding uh, base might be better situated situated to face um, um, uh, um, necessities that come uh, out of nowhere and uh, are not part of a long process of uh, of development. And my final comment. Uh, in respect to this, is that often we see international NGOs competing with the national and to the, with the tiny NGOs on the ground. Um, they don't like that we point out uh, to this, 
uh, this is a sort of subject that we should we are not supposed to be to talk about uh, but it does happen all the time uh, and I think uh, uh, this recognition does not play against the, the the large international NGOs just put pressure on them to enter into coalitions or to give the space and help uh, with fundraising for those local um, NGOs that are directly uh, not just working with the, the stakeholders, but are facing sometimes themselves the issues that you want to, uh, for example, to litigate. Yeah, Marie, can I, can I say a couple? Yes. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Yeah, Jim, and then Alfred. So. Yeah, I'll be I'll be brief. Um, one, just in response to some of these recent um, comments, one thing I, I just wanted to mention was I would describe almost as a as a growing movement, one part of human rights, which is a movement we might call legal empowerment, and I think it it does represent part of what uh, Justice Benjamin was just talking about—a shift of resources. Um, if people are interested in this, you might look up an organization called NAMATI, N-A-M-A-T-I, actually started by one of our law school graduates, wonderful person. And it's really trying to empower people at the local level to, to use the instruments of law without relying on, on, on well, lawyers and, and experts um, uh, and, and, and big NGOs, partly through training paralegals. The same thing I want to say is my, my question in some ways was directed less at our panel uh, and more toward yesterday's speakers in a way. And I, I think I looked at the attendees list. I don't think any of them, <laughs> which is a shame because in some ways my question was really trying to get them to talk about the role of international institutions. Um, and I think what Alfred's talking about, I think is really central to human rights concerns generally, not just in the area we're talking about, which is that, and to some extent, this is what my colleague Sam Moyne writes about a little differently, but that human rights does have this kind of minimalist approach, and it can get at things that, to some extent, I think we have to see as symptoms, not, not underlying causes. Mm -hmm. And the powers that be, uh, that negotiate, treaties that are at the United Nations, that are at the U.S. State Department, in good times and bad, I, you know, um, I, you know, are protectors of the status quo to a large extent. And, you know, when we're really looking at a lot of the issues we're talking about, they are in the manifestations of centuries of sort of racially based capitalism. And if we're not unwilling to take seriously the undoing of some of those structures, um, we're not really going to get at environmental justice or the or the protection of the uh, defenders who are working um, at the front line, the way Alfred was describing. And so, um, you know, there's a gap between what we can do with the law and with human rights. Um, and this fundamental systemic change that, that we, I think probably most of us uh, in, this, um, in this conference want to see happen. Um, you know, just briefly, um, I want to go back and, um, and you know, still want to remind us of where we are in our existence. This is the age of the Anthropocene. And so, you know, we need to rethink everything. Everything is on the table. We need to rethink that. Um, what moral authority, what legal authority do we have to prescribe the parameters of what an NGO is supposed to be like? If you went to an indigenous village where people are organized, you see, oh, they don't have a board, a set of board where they are accountable to. They don't have a set of so-called managers. They don't have built in place a system of governance. People are struggling to protect their land, their forests, their resources from pollution. 
And yet we are prescribing how they should fit within our conceptualization of a system. And I, I, I feel bad repeating myself, that have terribly failed us. Failed us miserably. And you tell a defender who's in a village, who's organizes people, that it's not a, it's not a non-governmental organization because it does not fit within the prescription of a Eurocentric description of what a non-governmental organization is supposed to be. And so those individuals cannot advance the work of an NGO. Well, I have a message for you. Those are the folks who are at the front line and they are the ones who are delivering on climate change, on the environment, on poverty. They are the ones who are the feature of entrepreneurship, who from nothing with their bootstrap are advancing innovations in business entrepreneurship at their level, who are missing a process of coexisting with nature, while this harvest from nature. They are the ones who have developed collective protection to protect vast forest ecosystems and rivers. And we are still sitting there defining, you know, do they fit in our prescription of what an NGO is supposed to be like? They are influencing governance. They are influencing democracy. They are influencing uh, community-driven management of natural resources. They are doing it. They were the ones who told us centuries ago, centuries ago, do not cut the forest, do not cut the trees, do not pull up the oil. And we did, not, we did not listen to them. We refused to listen because we felt they were primitive, they were savages, they had very little the civilization, they did not measure up to us. We measured development and civilization by skyscrapers fast moving cars and vehicles we didn't listen to them and now the scientists are saying oh those were people who are right so now the planet is burning and yet we still figure out that the state do not fit in that prescription we have to rethink this whole process here and go back and learn from them i spent 20 years you know my foot my half lawyer coding librarian who laugh at me I traveled around the country in West Africa from towns and villages, swimming across rivers, walking across swamplands, and learning from Dickens who taught me so many things. Most of what I learned in my skills as a community lawyer did not come from law school, came from talking to Dickens who taught me what the lawyer is supposed to be like. They are my professors who taught me to have to rethink this whole process here. But we're trying to impose upon them a process like I said, has brought us to where we are now. So we shouldn't see an NGO has the so-called one who will sit down in an, an elite, in an urban area, who's looking forward to a, a foundation in Washington, D.C., or New York, or London, or Tokyo to transfer money to their account before they can start an activity. When those folks get up, is the bread and butter issue every single day whether or not they receive the funding, they are on the front line and they are advancing the protection of the environment and human rights. They are not waiting for donors to come there. So we shouldn't prescribe that for them. Let's empower them, let's support them, let's innovate them. This is what we really need to do. It is not happening. And sometimes I'm troubled when I sit down here for figure out why, you know, let's figure out what it is. Instead of all these bureaucrats and the relative that is not doing in the meantime, Look at the amount of species extinctions, forest loss, a, 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 a amount of carbon being released, water being polluted, defenders being killed, and wealth. Look at the wealth gaps. Look at the inequality gaps. Look at the exclusion gaps. That has failed us. And we're still figuring out that those who are at the front line who are dealing on these issues here, we're not empowering them, we're not supporting them. I was still trying to prescribe a system for them instead of learning from them. So Alfred, one of the, the challenges I've often seen um, or I've, I've thought about in the context of this is, 
is where some indigenous people or, or indigenous sovereign nations and groups who are doing all this important work may get some recognition at the international levels, whether it be through the UN um, indigenous people's organizations or, or those human rights uh, statues that, that uh, protect them, but less so within their own national government. government. And so I'm wondering where you, from your vantage point, um, how can we help or how can we support work where there's that 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 structural issue with the national government also uh, slowing progress or or slowing the the possibility for reform and change? Well, there are, there are many ways to look at that, and like I said, there's not a silver, there's not a silver bullet in how we want to to move that forward. So I gave an example. So um, when the government of Liberia, and I start with my own country, you know, give rights, you know, to mining companies and, 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 and agricultural companies to carry on this massive investment, we did not recognize the rest of indigenous people. And because of decades of abuse and disenfranchisement, because that's another thing about rights. When you subjugate people through centuries of abuse and disenfranchisement, you almost think it's evolved into a normative process that is acceptable. Yeah. And so we had to go back to those villages, to those communities and have a conversation with them, figure out what it is and learn from that history. And like, well, you know, we feel it's extremely powerless. But then you figure out where are the pressure points mm -hmm. along the different chains of who make decisions, whether it's the national government, whether it's the corporations going that and figure out how you can apply pressure on these different levels. So, for example, in our case, we realize that the companies that we're confronting have signed on to a trade with the process called the Round Table on Sustainable <laughs> Power Oil. And they have committed. They said, yeah. whether or not the government recognizes the rights of indigenous people, we will recognize and we will not take the land. And you know why? We apply the whole concept of free, prior, informed consent. Yes mean yes, no mean no, and the indigenous will have the veto. So they come to Liberia and they don't want to respect the veto of the communities. We document that and go around them and say they ignore the veto of the communities. That is investigated and they realize that and they stop. So two big oil palm, almost five billion dollars, had now divesting all of that process because why we managed to find a way to elevate that right. We follow the money. And when Jim said earlier about the role of these international financial institutions, uh, export credit agencies, bilateral arrangement, you know, these different banks, we got to figure out how to go that. And I think there's a whole realm of law that many folks are not looking at. The whole uh, jurisprudence around soft law that many are pursuing. Yeah, yes. Whether it's working with the complete system of the international financial organization, whether it's working with the national contact points of the OECD, you know, whether it's working with the Forest Stewardship Council or term dispute resolution process, whether it's pursuing cases within the human rights systems, we're now trying to apply that to see how that applies. So, for example, I have a current case now with the International Finance Corporation Complaint System, the CEO. They just did that initial assessment, right? And surprisingly, things that information that we're trying to generate from the companies, from the government that was not available. When the CAO, which is the Compliance Advisory Ombudsman, issued their initial, just their assessment, the initial assessment of the eligibility of the case, they had information that we needed. And we just took that information and the lawyers that I work with now are going to pursue a domestic litigation realized, uh, re relying on that information given to us by the compliance advisor on bondsmen. Why? Because the, 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 the business which is involved signed out and said, in my operation in Liberia, I commit to abide by these set of principles. I will protect the rights of indigenous people. I will not pollute the river and I will respect the rights of workers. And the assessment showed that those were all violated. So we include and say, yeah, what our commitment is, yeah, is what an independent body. This is not 
your quote unquote NGO. This is now your activist from Pluto. This is the compliance advisory ombudsman of the International Finance Corporation that offered the loan to this company. Here is the independent assessment of how this business violated the performance standards. So we are now asking a court of Liberia to apply those standards consistent with the application of this. Thing. And we're pursuing that. This is how soft law gets hiding. Yeah. We've got to figure out what our remedy is. This goes back again to what they were talking about uh, uh, last night, um, that the lending banks, the international lending banks, perhaps need to have a, a, a strong restructuring. And I, I do love this concept of soft law. Um, I'm going to end with, because we're a little bit over time, but I want to ask one more question, drawing from what the audience have, have chatted about and bringing us back to where we started with Antonio um, on uh, constitutions. and. I, I'm not sure if I entirely understood early on, but but I sort of got the sense that you were saying some of these nations that have uh, recognized environmental rights within the constitutions um, are not successful because the, the the way rights and duties line up with individuals uh, don't match that framing um, within the constitution. I'm not no. sure. If no, no, no. Before, what Okay, before you answer that, because then I'm going to dovetail to a question someone asked. I may have that wrong, but then someone asked, what would a constitution look like that would do uh, put the pr protections for environmental environmental defenders as a priority? So maybe that's the right question to focus yes. on. <laughs> well, uh, uh, well uh, he, he, what I said is that the, there is this disconnect between the constitutional language, yes. which is new, uh, it's from the 70s, 80s, and more recently the 90s, and the civil procedure framework uh, that regulate access to justice, precisely what Alfred was talking about. So, uh, echoing what Alfred was saying, why is that we allow companies to be um, to, uh, uh, to be registered? Um, in a place that nothing is required. We don't know who are the owners. And those companies then buy other companies and then they buy a uh, huge uh, territory <laughs> and a beautiful real estate in Manhattan, in London, in Paris. And that's fine for us judges and the legal system, but it's not fine when a local, uh, um, uh, uh, a small group of people that have been living in an area say we want our day in court yes so uh, why is it fine that uh, a ship that you know has its captain uh, or her captain killed <laughs> and, and arrives at the harbor and the ship itself goes and knock on the door uh, of uh, the local court we accept this we even call uh, in English uh, this ship she uh, because we don't have the it in our language. Um, so why is that all those things, including the will uh, that designated the property to St. Anthony is legal mm -hmm. and we block those uh, people that want to bring their cases to the courtroom, but not St. Anthony or the Virgin Mary or, uh, you know, whatever entity um, uh, that, that is in, in this wheel. My final comment is that we have a disconnect between the political and the legal discourse. And the disconnect is we accept that this a foundation of the rule of law that is one person, one vote, and that everybody should have access to the ballot uh, box. But we don't accept that everybody should or can have her or his day in court, especially if this person is trying to protect not her property, not her tribe, not her family, but is trying to protect future generations and uh, the community of life. So that those were the, were the contradictions that I was trying to point out. And I believe it is in complete agreement with what Alfred and and Jim and and Tim said, because I think it's too much law. We live in a too much era. 
after the laws, after the system that we need to rethink. Those are archaic laws. Yes. It, it, there's no way it's going to deliver on our modern issues here, especially in the age of the Anthropocene. Yeah. I, I, just add, uh, Amity, oh, just one, I just want to say, and it's emphasizing something they said, legal systems vary enormously, and some legal systems have created openings for ordinary people and groups to have access to the court. A number of Latin American countries have this process of tutela where you can go straight to the high court. Uh, India has this public interest litigation. Exception. Uh, yeah. India is an exception. exception that's true. We're talking about the rule here. We, we, we are looking at more of the rule and not the exception. We can start to realize that when we get word, word, they always have another word to say. Is yeah, that but what the said SMT here is that the United States that was a pioneer in citizen suits in collective access to justice is nowadays the place that we don't want to mirror. We want, <laughs> if we want to give access, collective access to justice and change our civil procedure rules, we need to look at the United States, frozen in the 70s and early 80s, and, and to other experiences like India or Brazil and you know, other countries in the world. All right, I, we just got a smile out of Jim and Tim, so I think that was a, 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 a moment of agreement. Um, and thank you, Alfred, Antonio, Tim and Jim, obviously amazing discussion, we clearly could go on for, for a very, very long time.